Welcome back everyone to another episode of Psycho Cinematic. Today I am sitting down with Mike Pesci, the writer, director, and producer of 12KM. Thank you, Mike, for being here. It means a lot. Dude, thanks for having me. And then let me just say, let me <laughs> say, thanks for doing that fucking post. <laughs> <laughs> yeah man <laughs> who knew it'd blow up that much but uh definitely knew it could go somewhere uh, dude not uh, there <laughs> how, all, all right all right I'm, I'm jumping in i'm hijacking your shit here what the fuck happened <laughs> like, how yeah. did... first of all uh, so for anyone who doesn't know yet and don't know who you are or the film uh you made a short film that was about 30 minutes long and it was exclusive like you could only watch this film if message if they messaged you top three favorite horror movies and super enticing because you're like oh my gosh what if uh i'm not good enough what if my film suck what if he's a big snob what if i i don't know it, it doesn't you know that's super enticing and yes, yes. I heard yeah. about it on Corridor's podcast. And uh, that, that was like, oh, man, that, that's right up my alley. And I've never covered a short film on here. So I was like, I got to try. And then, you know, like five days after I sent it, I got the link. I was like, sweet, that's next up. And then, you know, I watched it twice and I really dug it. So nice. I was like, I know like, because when I make these now, I, I think about how I can get people on other platforms to watch it in a shorter fashion, be a little enticing. And I was like, this is already enticing enough. Like, I literally just need to say what it is. And then, <laughs> you know, I was like, I just have to be careful with some certain words and like, you know, make sure not to say short film, just movie yeah. because people might not be as interested. And that's all I did. And then all of a sudden, this two week old video <laughs> just started getting traction, which is wild. Uh, okay, hold on. I, I, I feel like I have to say this on the record because I've been... <laughs> this thing is blown up so huge, so mm -hmm. huge that I have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands <laughs> of direct messages right now that I am attempted to respond to, and I'm responding to all of them. And I'm getting thousands of comments that are like, what an amazing marketing scheme. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's People what's not commenting, a paid, <laughs> paid. <laughs> yeah. This is an Dude, ad. Dude, you, you and I don't know each other. This is physically <laughs> no. the first time that we're having a communication. Yeah. Uh, I think this I just sent the... you a link. Yeah. Um, yeah, dude. And the uh, crazy serendipity of the internet. Oh, you know? it's, a, it's insane. And look, full transparency Prior to this, I, I would just, I've said that on my podcast a lot, um, that uh, if you want to see the movie to my fans, send me your three favorite links, because I, I like to communicate with fans. I like to communicate with folks. And when I went on uh, Carter's podcast, I just sort of said the same thing, and I kind of chuckled about it. And I was like, if you want to do this, send the, the links, you know, mm -hmm. and we'll go from there. Because generally, what I would get is maybe a hundred or a few hundred uh, DMs from folks, and I'd get to meet these people. And it's more important for me to meet people that want to see my movie now because then I can sort of get instant feedback on what I've done, but also just sort of form relationships with an audience. And I think right. in in the world of the sea of the internet where you dump something on fucking YouTube and it just floats off into nothingness and no one sees it, uh, <laughs> this is incredibly important. And it, yeah. it, it in my mind, it's sort of... As similar, it's like when I used to do screenings in person and I'd have fans come and see movies in person and I'd literally stand in the door and as people came through, I'd shake their hands and say, hi, how are you? Welcome to the screening. What's your name? How'd you hear about us? And then after I would do the screening, I would generally go, hey, we're all going to this bar. So if you guys have questions about stuff, if you guys want to talk to me, come have some beers and, and we'll do it. And so... Mm -hmm. Uh, this was the best way that I could do that on the internet, realistically. Mm. So, um, to address <laughs> to address <laughs> to address all those folks that write to me and they're like, "You're a gatekeeper, and this is a scheme, <laughs> and all that stuff." I, my response generally is like, "You guys are schemed on every fucking day." by every major corporation out there, like mm -hmm. all of the ads that you get, you think they're, that are organically coming to you. They're crafted yeah. by these giant corporations. <laughs> I'm just a dude. I'm just a, like a, like a, an indie filmmaker that's doing this. 
And I guess it's easier to start yelling in my direction because I'll respond to you. But mm -hmm. um, it's nuts, man. It's just yeah, it, the overwhelming support and the amount of people that have seen this movie in the course of a week. I mean, what are your what are your numbers at right now? Like three million views? Yeah, or it's uh, nearing three point five million, which is wild. <laughs> Holy <laughs> that, shit! I've never had a video go over a million, and especially on Instagram, ne like not even close. Before that, was like sixty thousand. <laughs> so I was like, what? I mean, just from this, like I know your account's blown up like crazy too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I now I've gained more followers than I had. <laughs> Like <laughs> yeah. I had like 1700 and now it's like close to 4,000. I'm like, Whoa, that's yeah. crazy. First two days. I think I got like 20,000 new follows. And then consistently, like as we're speaking now, I will show you guys what I'm talking about. Like as we're having this conversation right now, if I go into my Instagram account and go to the request folder, which is the people that you don't follow or don't follow you. And mm -hmm. I go there right now and I refresh it. I have 20 messages that came in right now and we'll check it again in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you will see. It's so uh, speaking of those messages, I I got like 50 messages who are like, I want to see your film. Here's my movies. And I'm just like, uh, <laughs> like if you miss the part where it's not my film, I'm just surprised that they even got in there to like, you need three horror films. I'm just like, man, I, I <laughs> I'm just glad people are finding their way to you because I know. it's like, I'm not the guy think like nice picks, but <laughs> it's not me. I also thought it was smart of you to put the, is it clever or pretentious at the end yeah. of it? Cause I knew people would have opinions. <laughs> yeah. Which I think is like the main reason why this thing jumped off the top um, and I, I was joking about it on our last podcast recording where <laughs> I'm completely the most unpretentious person. People write to me on, on like Monday of last week. Right. And that was like the fucking levy broke on Monday. And so it was mm -hmm. just an over swarm of things. So they write to me on Monday and then the message just sort of gets lost in the sea of these messages. And so a lot of folks will then ping it again. So like Tuesday, they'll ping it again. Wednesday, they'll ping it again. And really, you're up, you're up against the luck of the draw, whether or not I sign on and check those messages at that moment. Um, because I try to go as far back in the, in the queue as possible. But Instagram as a platform really sucks for this kind of thing. So as soon as I go back like 10 or 15 pages, it starts lagging like fucking crazy. Mm. It's, it's very difficult to manage uh, stuff on this scale. So um, <laughs> I will sign on and catch somebody, randomly catch somebody who has been messaging me all week. And you just see the, it's such a weird psychological experiment. You see the degradation of folks where they send a list and they're like, <laughs> here are my movies. Oh, no. <laughs> I love these movies. These are great. And then they don't hear from me and they go, oh, I guess you don't like those movies. And then they don't hear from me anymore. And they go, well, why don't you like those movies? And then it's another post where it's like, well, fuck you for not liking those movies. And then it continues. It's like, this is just a scam. This is bullshit. And I just happen to grab their message when I sign on and I go, is it a scam? And then all of a sudden they're just like, oh my God, it's you. And I'm like, yes, it is. I'm sorry, man. Here's the link. Enjoy the movie. <laughs> That's funny. That uh, could potentially explain um, some of the comments that would just be like fake news. I'm like, what are you? <laughs> what is there to gain here about lying? It, it, <laughs> what? It's just so dumb. It is, man. It is. It is. And and what I've done is I know that I can't keep up with all of them, and so I've offered a lot of different options for people to be able to see it. Like if you listen to my podcast in love with the process, there are episodes that I actually put a link and a password in the episode. So mm -hmm. I'm basically rewarding you for spending the time and getting to know the podcast, which is a great place to go to learn about the movie and learn about the new movies that I'm doing anyways. So folks that tune into my show, there are two or three episodes out there that have the password in them. And so that's the fastest way to get a link to it. Um, mm -hmm. But then I'm also doing live sessions whenever I can. And I was, dude, I put everything on hold all last week. I spent seven fucking days sort of sorting through this. <laughs> and I would just do live sessions where there'd be like 600 people that would show up in the live room. And I'd go, all right, is everybody in here? Yeah, here's the link. And so I'd give them a link that would expire in 24 hours. And the room would just go. Whoop. 
<laughs> so it's just uh-huh. what's that feeling like um because this movie came out in 2016 right yeah so we shot this movie around 2016 did okay. the whole th- did the whole bit with it and released it well didn't release it I, I i sent it to festivals in 2016 and did all that in 2016 mm-hmm. yeah okay so i mean basically six years ago and like what's that like now for it to just kind of blow up get like a second push and you know it's kind of like you know people saying how artists don't get their flowers until after they die or whatever it in yeah. my eyes it kind of feels like you're getting your flowers now like yeah. people are i mean i don't know what it looked like before i'm not saying that this is like the Dude. biggest push i'm just saying like it's cool seeing like something that's six years old people are just jumping on like crazy yeah yeah well look i initially did the piece and i didn't I didn't release it to the public because the piece was originally designed to be a proof of concept for mm-hmm. feature. So for a feature film. And then what you do with a proof of concept is uh, you then take that out to uh, producers, to production companies and show them as a director, your tone, your vision. And you usually send that out with the script and that's part of the selling process to try to get a larger production company attached to your movie. So when I originally made this, it necessarily wasn't for public viewing. It was just um, to try to get the feature made. Gotcha. And I, I was going to submit it to festivals because I wanted to have the experience that I'm currently having on the internet in real life. And mm-hmm. so when I made the movie, I did... I did the research on the film festivals and they're like, okay, films will accept short films up to 40 minutes across the board. And I was like, cool, well, I'll do a movie that's 27, under 30 minutes and we'll be good to go. And so I edited the movie and I like to invite certain people into the edit room while I'm doing post-production and stuff. And I knew a couple festival programmers. So I was like, well, let me see what their response is to this. So I brought them in and showed them Uh, a version of it early on and they watched it and it was like a very awkward screening. I'm in my edit suite and the uh, guys are just super quiet. And after we finished filming it, I'm like, okay, you know, cause you're feeling everything, you know, in the room Mm -hmm. you're like, all right, what do you think? And they go, the movie's amazing. And I'm like, really? And they go, yeah, it's really great. And I go, fuck yeah. All right. I said, what festivals do you think I should submit this to? And they go, none, you're not going to get into any film festivals. And I went, well, why am I not going to get into film festivals? They go, because it's over 15 minutes long. And if you send it to film festivals, that if it's a piece that's over 15 minutes long in a shorts program, they can't program three or four other pieces in it. Mm. So they won't program you. And I was like, well, why the fuck do they say up to 40 minutes on their website? He goes, I don't know, but they're not going to fucking pro- try it. And so we only got into like two or three film festivals with it. And so when I first sent it out, I was like, well, that's a fucking disappointment. And I I had asked the guys when they were screening it, I go, well, what would you cut out? What do you think I should trim out of this to try to make this 15 minutes? And they go, don't cut anything out. The movie's perfect the way it is. And I'm like, okay, so I guess I'm just fucked on the film festival (laughs) circuit. I was like, where do I put this? Yeah. And so what I did is I just kept it private and I sent it around to a few um, folks that write articles and do reviews. And one of my friends, Izzy, she wrote a review for it and posted a review on a very popular website at the time. And she wrote a, a really glowing review for it and said, this is a movie that Hollywood should be making. And because of that review and because it wasn't on the internet, I then got calls from Netflix. I got calls from all these different places wanting to see it. Um, which then led to me getting representation and management. And this was back in 2017, 2018. Mm -hmm. Um, And then that led to them taking the short film out. And I went out to some of the biggest production companies that exist, you know, like Michael Bay's company, like all these different places. And uh, we ended up uh, at Ridley Scott's company, Scott Free, and they loved Mm -hmm. it. Ridley, Ridley supposedly loves the movie, which is amazing. I didn't get nice. to Nice, that's huge. That's huge, dude. Um, and so they are in development on it. So it's in this process really? of being developed. Yes. but That's awesome. Yeah, development takes fucking forever, man. And so <clears throat> when you're a filmmaker, 
especially for a movie like this, the feature version of this is still an indie, but it's more than what they would give a first time filmmaker for money. And uh, even though I've been directing for fucking 20 years. Um, so, uh, a lot of folks have been wanting me to do other movies first. So I've got a couple of other proof of concept films. A lot of people have been asking about my other ones that are just as crazy, just as fun that are smaller budgets that we're trying to get off the ground first. Um, nice. so, so then throw like COVID in the mix and throw everything else into the mix. Yeah. So it just takes fucking forever. So when people see that this was finished in 2016, this is generally what it takes for, unless it's like lightning in a fucking bottle and right. it just skyrockets. This is generally what it takes for time to get one of these made as a feature. So this getting made into a feature, are you going to stay as the director or yes. do they just take your entire, okay. No, cool. no, no, no. That's part of the game too, is that I'm still on as a director. Like I'm sure I could sell this thing off as a, as a script, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but, um, why the fuck do that? Like the amount of energy and time that I've spent on doing this thing. And then people seem to like my vision for this. So, um, I, I've just been fighting the long fight, um, right. with it, with this project. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I heard on corridors podcast that, you know, this was inspired by your head injury. And mm -hmm. I'm curious about like what specifically about this film was sparked with the head injury were you just is it because you like did you like have a bunch of trippy visions of things or did it like what provoked that thought well i mean for those of you who haven't heard the story um i slipped on the ice i went ice skating once to paraphrase it um i went ice skating once uh slipped on the ice i went on a date slipped on the ice fell back cracked my skull <clears throat> ended up in intensive care with a hematoma that was forming on the top of my brain so a pool of blood and it was inside the skull. We didn't break the skin or anything. And normally what they do to release the pressure is they drill into your skull mm -hmm. to release it. But my hematoma was right over the main blood vessel. So if they drilled too deep, then <laughs> ironically, mm -hmm. if they drilled too deep, then I would have bled out and died. So, um, so it sounds symbolic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of that. So then um, I was in intensive care for five days to see if the bleeding stopped. After five days, the bleeding did stop, but I still had this pool of blood that was were waiting for my brain to absorb. Through that, because of that, I had all these, and, and the multiple concussions, I had all these crazy, trippy sort of sequences that I was going through personally. And then I was convinced that my inner voice wasn't my own and that it was somebody else's mm. inner voice that was talking to me. And so then... Dang. Um, yeah, there was a lot of shit that happened with that while in intensive care that I found incredibly inspiring. And I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a horror director. So I would just turn to my girlfriend who was with me the whole time and I'd be like, get your phone out. You need to record what I'm going through. And I would tell her <laughs> would tell nice, her <laughs> all this stuff. And, um, a after the bleeding had stopped, I had to go into about five or six months of recovery from the concussions and everything that I had got, um, mm -hmm. And uh, in that period of time, I'm like, I'm going to write a feature. And I had heard about years prior, I'd heard about the well to hell story, the story of uh, the Kola Peninsula and the Russians that dr drilled the deep mm -hmm. soul. And so I wanted to come up with an origin story for what was happening in my mind and what this creature was doing in my mind. And I'm like, that's perfect. That's a perfect place for this thing to come from. And so then that's, you know, the connection that, that was made, you know. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. I w was wondering, uh, because this was a short film, now I know it's a going to be a longer feature. I was curious because it, it's such a big idea and the film is so short that it, you know, feels like we're just getting started and you're like, Oh, come on. And I was curious if you had already known when you made that short, even before the feature, uh, do you know where that story continued from there? Not, like it doesn't have to be the same as the feature film, but when you made that short film, like, did you know where it went after that? Yeah. I had ideas of what I wanted to see happen. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. to be clear, to be clear, I'm a director first. I am not a screenwriter first. So mm -hmm. when I wrote the script for the shorts, it was just to sort of set the tone and set the atmosphere and set the vibe. 
and I there's so many people that write the same thing where they go, I get to the end and I want more. I go, yeah, of course, because I craft it. It's a proof of concept. Mm. So I crafted it in such a way where you end it and you go, fuck, I want to do this specifically so that when I show it to a room full of investors, the room full of investors yeah. goes, we want to make this movie, you know, and uh -huh. that's why this thing is crafted to feel that way. Um, I teamed up and I met uh, Will Simmons, who's an amazing screenwriter. Mm -hmm. He's like a black uh, blacklist uh, screenwriter winner. And uh, him and I met up early on and I realized his talent. And one of the moves to be a successful director is to humble yourself and understand that there are more talented people at specific tasks than you are. Right. And so after I had read his script, so he was like, I want to do a uh, script for the feature for 12 cam. And I said, fuck yeah. Um, awesome. And so, yeah, so there is a Hollywood screenwriter that has written the script for 12 Cam. So a lot of you who are like, I didn't really like the script. I'm like, I get it. <laughs> Don't worry. The feature the feature has a Hollywood uh, screenplay writer that that is has been working on it for years. So Yeah. So are you allowed to say is it going to be uh following the same people or is it going to be like starting over? I don't want to give too much away. Um but let me just say what the original intent for this was. This originally, in my first version of what the feature would be, yeah. this would have just been the cold open. So instead of this being 27 minutes, because I, I stretched it out because I, I wanted to make a short film that I could screen in a theater. But if this was a feature, that would have been the opening 10 minutes. So I was also wondering, now that you've gotten all these extra internet watches and you know reviews and all this stuff but it's already going to be a feature is there any other way that you can leverage all this attention that you've been getting on this film to i don't know maybe like increase the budget or uh get other films in the future i think i'm finding that no matter what no matter how good your ideas are no matter how good your stuff is i think it just comes down to whether or not you have an audience and whether or not you have a fan base and whether or not you have folks that are engaging and interacting with you and so i think the benefit of what's been going on for the past week is that i have met a lot of really amazing die hard um, horror fans that are happy to be here, that love the movie, that are more than willing to repost about the movie, that are more than willing to do things. And so what I'm trying to do is drive all that traffic to my podcast, In Love With The Process, by the way, there's a plug, I'm trying to drive mm -hmm. all my traffic to, to that because then we're engaging on a regular on a regular basis. So if I need this fan base to say, Hey, do me a favor, go message this actor or do me a favor, go message this person. I can sort of put the, the group to work. And yeah. so many of these people want to be involved with filmmaking. And I don't mm -hmm. think they understand the power that we have as an audience right now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's been interesting. And then by by accident having people ask me or having people tell me what their three favorite horror movies are has been such an interesting um you know research and development sort of thing because yeah right i'm getting full access to thousands hundreds of thousands of people's loves for movies mm -hmm. and here's here's what i found so when you go and you pitch to hollywood and you go and you pitch to these places <laughs> A lot of these execs have an idea of what they think needs to be seen or what they think needs to be made. And a right. lot of this stuff is lately has been directly affected by what's going on with social issues and everything else. But so you'll go in or I'll go in to pitch a movie to folks. And for instance, I'll walk in with our other movie, which is called Who's There? And we went to pitch the week that Hereditary came out. So we went and pitched in this room and it didn't matter. No matter who we were talking to, they would go, so is this like Hereditary? Is this like this movie? Is this like that? And so Hollywood's always like, they're, they're like that kid in high school that's trying to impress the popular kid consistently. And so <laughs> they're just, they're running after things that they think are trends and they're trying to make... Uh, movies that they think are going to impress folks. And I think that's why a lot of the stuff that you see just feels kind of uninspired and oftentimes just desperate. And I'll say it like Marvel. 
<laughs> well, I'm not saying anything about those guys. <laughs> so, but my point is, it's this it's this race to make fast, quick cash for most mm-hmm. of these folks. Now, after doing this this experiment, um, you would be surprised. Well, I know for fucking that. I know that Hollywood would be surprised at the movies that consistently, consistently show up mm-hmm. on everybody's lists. And you can see some of the trends, right? Some of the stuff is based upon what the marketing and what the most popular movies that have been lately. Right. Um, like uh, Jordan Peele's movies. I love mm-hmm. his movies. He gets a ton of marketing. Yeah. So like Get Out, uh, Nope, all that stuff are, are religiously showing up on that list. Yeah. Hereditary is religiously showing up on that list. But what I love is that The Shining is on almost everybody's list. Mm-hmm. John Carpenter's The Thing wake up Hollywood because I don't know how many rooms that I've been into pitching our movie, which, you know, in its DNA has a lot of the thing in it. And people are like, young kids don't give a shit about the thing. And it's like, no, no, no. I have the numbers now. I can show you 18 to 35 uh, Mm -hmm. top three movies for these folks is John Carpenter's the thing. Um, So it's been an interesting, it's been an (laughs) interesting, It's been an interesting research and development in which I have this ammunition, which then I have to ask myself, like, how worth is it going to be me going in a room and going like, here's all this, you know, it's fucking hard. Yeah. Finding a use or like a (laughs) easy digestible way to just, you know, show them, you know, like what has happened and, you know, that would be great. Maybe even like a bar graph or something. The amount of people that said the thing, (laughs) which is I know, I know, dude, come on, man. Yeah. You know, and. They just brought the thing back to theaters uh, in my town and we went and saw it and the whole theater was packed. Like if you didn't buy your ticket the day before, it was gone, you know? So, I mean, it's a classic horror movie. It's one of the best. Where are you? Where are you at? Sparks, Nevada. Oh, so you're in Nevada. Yeah, Mm -hmm. they've screened it. I've seen it probably 12 times in the theater in the past, uh, I'd say, six years. Wow. And. Yeah, they screen it all the time out here in Los Angeles, and it always sells out. It, mm-hmm. it, it just, it's such a an influential movie, such a fun movie, and it shouldn't be as popular it is, as it is because all the effects are practical, which I mm-hmm. love. Yeah, um, they look the, great for being practical. Yeah. And God, yeah, some of them still blew my mind. But they're also slightly outdated, which is yeah. fascinating, and mm-hmm. it's not. There's no CGI, so. They start off by killing a dog or hunting a dog. <laughs> oh, I know, <laughs> you know dude. I, yeah, I, that I, part's I rough. <laughs> I, and that should be the... De- like, if I wrote someone shot a dog in a script, the execs <laughs> would be like, no. No yeah. one's going to want to watch this Get fucking out. movie. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it's fun to see, if anything, it just sort of rejuvenates my passion for this sort of thing. and And because I've spent four years in Hollywood pitching and going into rooms and getting rejections and going through the process of having folks tell you like, you need to write something that is more current. You need to write something that, that belongs here. This isn't your time. No one wants to hear your story. Just hearing these constant rejections Mm -hmm. coming from the people that are the fucking gatekeepers, (laughs) like the people that are actually the gatekeepers. Yeah. um, To he, to have this sort of exchange with this audience which, by the way, would never have happened if I had just dropped this up on YouTube. Yeah. Good never chance would it would have, have gone just like what Nowhere. you said. Like, just, yeah. Nowhere Who the fuck's going to click on a movie that's in Russian? Uh-huh. That's about this. Like, you know what I mean? Who's going to yeah. read the description for this thing? It just goes to show that engagement is important and being personal is important. And, you know, having the ability to to communicate with the creators that you love is Mm -hmm. important. I mean, that's the reason why I put the podcast together. I I have been directing music videos for years. Yeah. And I got a huge fan base based upon that. And I had people writing to me on a daily basis going like, I want to make movies or I tried to, I tried to start my own production company and it's failing. And uh, how does this work? And I'm like, how long have you been doing it? They're like for a year. And I go, dude, it's going to take eight years Mm -hmm. before anybody gives a fuck about you. And so that's why I started the show. The show essentially was like, look, I can't respond to all these emails, so I'll do it on a larger platform. And so then the podcast is, dude, we had the best year on our show prior to this. Like That's prior awesome. to this blow up, 
the view count on our podcast was equivalent. This year was equivalent to the five years prior to it. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So, yeah. So it's hopefully it's it continues crazy. in that trend. Yeah. Well, dude, this you know, the it new seems... year be better than the last one. Well, the the other thing too that I'll say on the show that I haven't said in public either. Um, whether or not it's 12 KM or whether or not it's who's there, Will and I are actually writing something new right now. We're going to make a a feature no matter what next year. And I think we're going to do, you know, if I can't get one of the larger ones, the fucking slow beast that is Hollywood. If, if I continue to have to wait on that, I'm just going to do a, a, an indie feature that will be scary and will be fun. And everybody that is involved with 12 km and everybody that loves 12 km will be there'll be an offer for them to be involved with this feature mm-hmm. and to be a part of this feature like a kickstarter ish something there like that. there might be some sort of kickstarter but more than anything i mean how often do you get to listen to a podcast or how often do you get to be involved with a filmmaker that you like that is going to make a feature and then you get to listen to the process of a feature being yeah. made before you actually see the feature mm-hmm. and so that's kind of the goal, I think, yeah. for this coming year, you know? Yeah, that would be sweet. I'm I'm really excited just to see your work in a longer fashion because I just wanted to see where it was going to keep going. I mean, it ended right at the climax and it's like, it's the most frustrating <laughs> feeling. Uh, yeah, that figure running past in the end. Oh, yeah, you like that, huh? Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, it, like, it's like instant hair standing up i was like oh holy sh-. like this is getting way worse than you know because i was like oh black sand kind of like right now it's kind of feeling like uh like almost uh calm like now you're just uh like because you hear the sound of the water and i was like uh oh, it feels calm and then just <laughs> I was like, oh god we're back in we're back in if you guys have seen the movie you know that i'm a big fan of suspense uh, I'm a big fan of like uh, slow burn terror and slow burn horror. Um, and I, I've been very happy with the response that I've got from thousands of people that they like that this movie is not just a jump scare movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm I'm kind of a fan of using all the tools in your box to make something really scary, whether it is doing a jump scare now and then to, to rev the audience up or if it's to drop out audio completely. Um, the idea of using specific tones that make the audience feel uncomfortable when they're listening to it is important. Um, all that stuff. I think it's really fun when you, I think th- that's why I do horror. I think it's fun to be able to let the audience in on the technique mm-hmm. while they're watching it and have the technique actually play a, an important part in the story of the piece. Right. A great example of that is, um, don't, um, Oh God, Jesus! My, my my brain just shut down. Um, what was the one? Uh, my brain just shut right the fuck off. It's the, it's not "Don't Breathe." It's the, um, the one with the dude from the office. Oh my God, uh, my brain just shut down. Dude from oh the my office. God. <laughs> you can't make a no, you you can't make a sound right because there were all the aliens. Oh there. oh uh, oh my God. See. I, I just gave it to you. Uh, a quiet place. You the, quiet place. A quiet place. Yeah. Thank you. I haven't slept. I've been answering this. <laughs> um, so a quiet place is a great example of that. Yeah. Like letting the audience in on a technique. And I remember seeing that movie in the theater and <laughs> people would get mad at folks that made any sound. Mm-hmm. They'd be like, what are you doing? Yeah. Because they were so involved in in the technique with it. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. I think... I, with my two movies that I'm doing right now, there are, are like sort of that audience involvement piece, mm-hmm. which is important. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Um, I think I also like the horror thing because you basically get grabbed by the filmmaker and manipulated to, you know, like react the way they want you to react. You know, with comedy, it's kind of like that. But I mean, you might not laugh, but there are certain things that are undeniably scary, whereas I I think the undeniably uh, funny things is based more on how people, you know, like their sense of humor and such. So I think that is 
pretty good. Like if you're doing your job well, like you can make someone uneasy. You could make them jump if you wanted to, you know, you could sure. play on the fact that they think a jump scare is coming right now, but it's not, it's like five minutes down the road, you know, like that's the thrilling thing I feel like for me about horror is that like you get strapped down and you're just along for the ride. Yeah. A hundred percent, dude. I joke around that if I wasn't doing horror, I would do romantic comedy because romantic films uh, are the same thing, but on the other end of the spectrum. So like you using a lot of those same techniques to make you fall in love with the actor or actress, you're using those same techniques to like make them cry and to go through this whole process. So it's, they're opposite ends of like the, the sort of really, um, high end sort of technical manipulation. <laughs> yeah. I've heard <laughs> that comedy doing. is much like horror. If you like just change the, uh, the sounds that are there, you know, into like horror sounds, a comedy would look like, which is why like Jordan Peele seems to be so good at horror, but I'm going to have to tell my wife, like, this is probably why I like rom-coms. She yeah, kind of roasts me 100%. for it, but I like them. A hundred percent, dude. Especially 100%. Christmas like, ones. <laughs> yeah, man. Let me look at the end of the day. You go to see a movie f to escape. And mm. I think there's been this sort of, how do I say this without being, there's been this sort of shift where social, where movies became sort of platforms and soapboxes mm -hmm. for a lot of social messaging. And, and when you start to get too deep into that, it's exhausting. You sort of hit this point where you're like, all right, I'm being berated. And what I'm trying to do is just sort of escape and lose myself in this mm. film uh, and lose myself you don't get on a roller coaster and before you go on a ride on the roller coaster, they start telling you about people with breast cancer. You know what I mean? Like you're just yeah. like, I want to go for a ride on this fucking roller coaster. Yeah. And cinema can be powerful. Cinema can be that, that thing where it is, you know, teaching you new things about people, uh, uh, teaching you how to be empathetic. I think empathy is like one of the strongest things that you can do with movies mm -hmm. and, consistently with horror horror has always been um a subtle way to sort of talk about what's happening with society you go back and you look at the first um night of the living dead and what happened at the end of that movie with the black lead character and everything else that happened i mean that was a a, a wonderful sort of social commentary on what was happening at that time period but it, that was very secondary to the experience the experience right. was going to see this thing. And I think uh, studios uh, had figured out that they would get more traffic. <laughs> they should have just done what we did. They mm. would get more traffic to their stuff if they had like heavy duty sort of social context that pissed people off. I mean, look what they did with, um, you know, Ghostbusters when they had the, the whole female Ghostbusters lineup. Yeah. Um, regardless of whether or not you like that movie, that movie was specifically crafted in such a way for right. the negative comments that it got on the internet, which drove a lot of traffic to that piece. And mm -hmm. I think that we're just living in like a five year sort of period where that's it. You're either making a movie about an IP that has a, over a hundred years of history building superheroes and everything else, which doesn't require any fucking marketing yeah. or you're just looking for that that insane dopamine rush on the internet. And I hate to say it, most of the time when you get angry, that's a larger dopamine rush than if you're excited yeah. or if you're in, lo in, in love with stuff. And so they know this shit, man. Yeah, they know there's a lot shit. of that going around, <laughs> that anger. Yeah, there's a lot of fucking anger going around yeah. there. I, and so like when you guys want to talk about manipulation... My argument has always been that films are made by filmmakers. Films are, are, are stories that are told through voice. Now, I'm not saying that filmmakers could do it all by themselves. You need crew. You need cast. You need the support of a production company that supports filmmakers or a yeah. studio that supports filmmakers. You know, uh, go back and look at uh, the 70s and Paramount. There's a great series on Paramount Plus right now. Um, called The Offer, where they talk about mm -hmm. how The Godfather was made, but also all these other great movies at that time period. And there was someone at the studio that genuinely was supporting filmmakers and putting filmmakers yeah. first. Um, and I think that's something that as we sort of progress into the Hollywood that is corporate Hollywood, I think it's more important for them to have the logo first than it is the filmmakers first. Mm -hmm. And so 
I think people are responding heavily, obviously, to Jordan Peele because he's a filmmaker. Yeah. And he's being advertised <laughs> as a filmmaker first. And so you're going to tune into Jordan Peele's movies because of his ability to tell stories. You're going to mm -hmm. tune into M. Night Shyamalan's movies, mm -hmm. whether or not you like his last ones, because yeah. he, he's a filmmaker that tells stories. And so I hope that we head back that way with a lot of younger filmmakers, because these days, if you're a young director, your movie just gets dropped on Netflix. If you're fucking mm -hmm. lucky, if you're yeah. at the top, it gets dropped on Netflix. It ends up in a queue with like, you know, the great bake off <laughs> fucking like car restoration yeah. shit, you know, and you're in this fucking queue and no one knows who you are. Um, and you just sort of get lost in the game. And I think it's more important to build an audience and to build a fan base that knows you as a storyteller, because that gives me the leverage to yeah. make the movies that you want me to make, because I can literally say to the money people like, no, 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 fuck you, man. Like the people, the fans, the folks, that are behind me want me to do this this way and I want to do it that way. Yeah. So let us do it that way and let us make you some money. I was thinking about your film and we're talking about leverage and whatnot and the reviews that you ask people to leave. How do you um, balance that? You know, Cause obviously you're gonna get good and bad reviews. Are you taking them all to heart? Are you trying to not let any of it influence you? You know, like what, what does that look like? No, dude, look, I love bad reviews. I learn more from bad reviews than I do good reviews. And maybe it's just that dopamine shit we were talking about earlier. <laughs> like a bad review gives me a, a, a stronger rush as I read bad reviews. I, <laughs> I, I was reading it. them. <laughs> dude, I was reading them on, a, on our episode last week on the show. And the, the thing about all the reviews that we've got so far, good and bad, and especially the bad ones, people are like, you know, they might, they, they get very sort of granular, right? And, and so one of the things to do when you're processing reviews, I, I'm always doing like sort of a psychological profile on them instantly. So you're looking at how they use their grammar. You're looking mm -hmm. at what they're repeating multiple times. You're sort of examining what they're hyper-focused on because I'm trying to get to the source of it. There has been some uh, responses that I think I agree with. Where I'm like, all right, I made this movie in 2016. I've learned a fuckload since then. And yeah, maybe that music cue isn't right. Got it. And consistently across the board, that music cue is taking people out. I made a mistake there. That music cue shouldn't be there. Got it. I'm learning something. Mm. So now with those negative responses to that, I'm like, all right, my ego is being checked. And I'm mm. like, I thought that music cue was the shit. But I can't deny the fact that this many people don't like it. And I don't like the response that it's giving them. I'm not going to change it because you don't like it. Yeah. I'm going to change it because it's not giving you the response that I need. So that's the positive aspect of, of uh, negative reviews. But I, like, like I was saying, if you do a psychological profile of these folks, you can really sort of understand where they're coming from. I, I, I talked about this on my show last week. I could put a redhead lead in the movie, right? And I could put... A, uh, a woman with red hair as, as the lead actress in the film and then have someone come out and fucking shit on that movie and go, I hate that fucking movie. I hate everything about it and I hate the whole ordeal. And I go, well, why? And they go, I just didn't like the redhead. I didn't like the actress. And I go, why? And then it comes to down to like, well, when I was young, I had a babysitter and she was a redhead and she was really mean to me and she was abusive. And I go, oh, okay. <laughs> 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 like, I get it, man. That sucks. But, the, but they're... When people go and watch a movie, whether you're watching it on your phone or they go and sit in a theater, they're bringing in their life experiences with them. And they're processing films with their life experiences. And the best thing to do as a filmmaker is have a vision, have a voice, have an idea, but then go on a ride with an audience and leave it open-ended as much as you mm -hmm. possibly can. Don't answer all the questions. Don't go through the process of doing that because those life experiences that people are bringing into that film will make it bigger yeah make it more interesting and make it interesting like so your review on the movie when mm -hmm. you left your review which i think is a great review and you started Thank to you. talk about mythology and you started to go into all that stuff it's fascinating it's not necessarily the stuff that i was thinking about mm -hmm. when i was making the film but you're not wrong um the stuff that you were referencing makes a lot of fucking sense and i think in the zeitgeist of the human experience, a lot of these stories cross over and there is mm -hmm. a lot of crossover with stuff that happens. So 
Well, I'm glad you said that because I wanted to ask, like, wow, did I have nail on the head or did I make up all that stuff? (laughs) (laughs) Well, dude, there was a level. uh, I'm not going to get too deep into spoilers just in case people haven't seen it. But I know that people are tuning in that have seen it and that are looking for answers. So let me just go spoiler. (laughs) Okay. Um, There is a level uh, at the end of this movie where the entire environment changes and we sort of go into this space. If you understand where I'm coming from, which is psychological, you would sort of put the pieces together that this is happening inside of his brain and that this is something that he's confronting. And the, the history of this creature... So Will and I have done a lot of research on this. I don't want to give too much away, but as they drill down in this planet, they find this creature. And this creature in this in the planet itself is in this liquid form. And down in the world, the the container that it's holding it resonates this sound. And this sound keeps this creature with within that sort of liquid form, which is its, its strongest form. Um, but what it can also do certain layers of sediment that are up higher um, have dried out and they go airborne. And so they, they can, it's, it's like having like a, a safety parachute that they're, it's sending up. As soon as someone cracks into this containment, it sends up sort of this, this uh, like, like uh, cellular level versions yeah. of itself. And so the idea when you watch the short, you're seeing a lot of people breathing it in. You're seeing that they're covered in this dust, in this dirt, in this grime. My idea was that the creature is at its weakest form at that point. Mm. But what it can do is it can affect you psychologically when you're at your weakest form. So it can take the form of your inner voice and suggest things to you. So it may have suggested to certain folks that had visited the site before drilling, maybe here Mm. you should be drilling here. Maybe it had suggested to certain folks that you should go do this. You know, like, so Mm -hmm. as you breathe this thing in, it's, it's manipulating you. And once they finally crack into the surface and they lower microphones, why would they do that? Suggested to them. So they lower microphones down into this place which then releases this specific tone, which then liquefies mm. all of the dust that is in the space. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, that was the that was the in, initial intent. So there's been a lot of folks that have been asking, like, what is that and how does that happen? You know, that would be further explained in a feature version of this. And I yeah. don't feel like I'm giving anything away. I'm just mm. sort of laying the mythology for what this thing is. <sighs> Because there's something fascinating about a creature that can infect multiple people and give them all the same thought. Mm -hmm. And then you start to have almost like these zombie-like movement patterns and you start to have all this really fun stuff. So when you watch this movie, it really just sort of taps the surface of the rules that can make this really interesting. Now let me say this. Because this movie isn't a werewolf movie, because this movie isn't a vampire movie, because this movie is very original and we're creating all our own rules and we're creating all our own stuff, it has made it almost impossible to make. Yeah. Because most studios are like, the audiences aren't going to get it. They're not Mm going to understand this stuff, which puts us in this loop because so many of us are looking for original content. We're looking for some new story that makes a lot of sense, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I hope... (laughs) That with all this attention and stuff, there's more ammunition for us to be like, look, the audience doesn't give a fuck Mm -hmm. whether or not it's a vampire movie or whether or not it's an alien movie or something else. Like, let's create a new horror, something that's new and terrifying. And the rules can be opaque Mm -hmm. um, and slowly sort of come to an understanding. Maybe you don't figure it out until, until the feature two. Maybe... It takes a little bit longer as long as the moments that we're going through with the characters are purely terrifying mm-hmm. and you go through sort of this roller coaster ride of, of horror. Yeah. You know? I, it, it's funny. I've actually said on here how much I just, if there was never another vampire movie, I'm fine. Like, I'm so tired of yeah. vampires and werewolves. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah, dude. And I've written treatments for werewolf movies, I've written treatments for vampire movies. 
uh, with the hope that they're going to get made. And then you're just sort of like, well, everybody knows this fucking story. Everybody knows know. this mythology. We were talking about earlier that, you know, having videos or movies land on Netflix is not ideal for, at least for you saying like, you know, as like a, you want to be the filmmaker, you want to have the video being seen by people and not just lost next to like the cake challenges and stuff. I was actually going to ask if there was ever a opportunity for this to turn into like a limited series or um, a TV show, would you rather do that than a film or are you just trying to stick to solely film? Well, I mean, I think the only, I'll put this out there and I just put this out there to my management team. Write to Guillermo del Toro, everybody, and tell him he needs to watch 12KM. Write to Guillermo. Because I think Write that... Guillermo. I think that uh, Cabinets of, uh, Cabinet of Curiosities is, is genius. And uh, I thought that the episodes of that show, which are on Netflix, are so good. I think it's some of the best horror and best terror stuff that's made recently. Nice. Um, and I love what Guillermo is doing with his filmmakers. He actually points out the filmmakers at the beginning of each piece... He is completely supportive to them. I would be honored to have any sort of uh, connection to that. And, um, you know, if I had to do 12, if at the end of the day, we couldn't get 12 cam made into feature, if I had to do it as like a cabinet of a cabinet of curiosities episode, I would totally do that. I think that would be so much fun to do. So yeah, uh, those of you listening right to Guillermo, I think he's on Twitter. Uh, write to Guillermo and uh, tell him that he needs to watch 12 cam. We're trying to get to him on the back end, but uh, nice, you know, little nudging helps everybody. Yeah, I've yet to watch that, so I'm gonna definitely have to check that out because I'm always looking for you know the new good stuff. Uh, oh my god, dude, did you see um, man? <clears throat> sorry, my voice. Did you see Mandy? No. Oh, <laughs> okay, so have you seen Beyond the Black Rainbow? Uh uh-uh. uh. Okay, I'm about to blow your mind. Uh, right. A lot of a lot of fans listening love this stuff. So there is a director. His name is Panos Cosmatos. He did a movie years ago called Beyond the Black Rainbow, which was this stunning, trippy, strange, felt very 80s, intense movie. And I saw it in a film festival with this audience. And it's like Gaspar Van Noe meets like uh, your favorite John Carpenter 80s stuff. It's like crazy and so beyond the black Mm -hmm. rainbow uh was highly influential and so later he ended up teaming up with spectra vision and they made a movie called mandy starring nicholas cage and Mm -hmm. it is just as crazy not as it's a little bit more form function form like it's more formed as a film like a traditional film basically nicholas cage is a lumberjack whose wife is uh kidnapped and killed this is in the taglines i'm not giving it away his wife is kidnapped and killed by a uh a zealot sort of religious group and he goes on a revenge Mm. rampage with a chainsaw so when you read that you go this sounds fucking nuts and then (laughs) you throw panos's style on it and his tone on it and it's a trip it's a it's an acid trip it's it's absolutely crazy he's made those two movies which are incredibly influential and I've been in pitch meetings where I talk to execs and I'm like, how come Panos isn't doing something? And they're like, he's too fucking crazy. And so (laughs) like, I know that he had written, I had heard rumors that he had written a treatment for the Hellraiser piece. I had heard that he had written treatments for a couple of movies and no one's been green lighting him. Hmm. Um, Guillermo brought him in for cabinets of curiosity and he does an episode. I think it's like episode seven or something. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's got, um, What's his name? Eric Andre is in it. And oh, okay. It, it is so fucking crazy. It is so fucking wild. It is so cool. That's um, awesome. I got to check those out. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's it's, super cool. Eric Andre in a uh, horror. That's cool. And it's fucking, it's crazy. It, look, mm. I say to a lot of folks, as especially people that are leaving reviews, I, it's like there are different types of movies out there. There are movies that you watch because... It has sort of a cliffhangery sort of structure, right? Mm-hmm. And, or there are movies you watch that have that are like uh, you know uh, twisty, right? So like you've got Kaiser Soze, right? You've got you've got si- um, or not signs. Um, the first one that uh, what's his name did 
Oh my uh, God. Six cents. Six cents, right? So you have that kind of formula, mm-hmm. um, which I like. But the movies that resonate with me more than anything are the experience films, the movies that are connecting with the audience in such a strange and sort of experiential way. And if you walk out of a film and you're like asking a fuckload of questions and it really freaks you out, and two or three days later you're like, I still can't wrap my head around. I just watched uh, uh, Cronenberg's new movie, The uh, Crimes of the Future. Mm-hmm. And if you were to judge that movie on script alone, you'd be like, what? <laughs> but, but the experience itself is so strange that yeah. days later, I'm still going like, why did they have those weird chairs that they ate breakfast in? That was strange. Like, yeah. So I think with horror, I find that stuff to be more powerful. And I think mm-hmm. uh, here I am advertising for Panos. I think that's what I like about his <laughs> movies. Yeah. Have you seen um, that movie Vivarium? It's an alien one. What's it called? Vivarium, like V-I-V-A-R-I-U-M. No, what's it about? So it's like this couple, Jesse Eisenberg is the main character in there. And it's he, it's he and his wife. I don't know that actress's name. Um, they go to uh, buy a house and there's like this creepy real estate agent dude. But they go and get a house in a cookie cutter neighborhood. Every house looks the same. And they go and look in the house and the realtor's just gone they can't figure out how to get out of this uh, neighborhood. Like they just drive all night until they run out of gas. And <laughs> I, I won't spoil it because I, I know I want you to see it eventually. But there is one part at the very end where because it's kind of a boring movie the entire time. I was interested because I really like aliens. Um, but, you know, uh-huh. I referred it to a few other people and they hated it. Um, uh-huh. But my wife and my family, we all loved it. Um, it's super slow. And then all of a sudden shit hits the fan and you're just like, what the fuck just happened? And, uh, yeah, I was so disturbed. It was one of those times where it's like, I don't want to go to sleep right now. I should probably like watch the office or something. Cause yeah, I'm so disturbed and that I haven't had a feeling like that in a long time where, I mean, I'm just creeped out for the next couple of days. I don't want people to quote the movie. <laughs> just shut up. But Dude, now I, I'm like on fire about it. I think a lot of people don't really, everybody is so used to having their senses um, overloaded consistently. You know, mm. like we're always feeding ourselves with dopamine and no one wants to be bored. They go on their phone consistently. If there's a moment of pause where nothing interesting is happening, they're on their phone just looking for that. Mm. You got to realize with some filmmakers, David Lynch specifically, they are about building tone. And so they may do a very long running opening sequence, or they may do first two acts that are just treacherous to get through because <laughs> yeah. it's it's putting you in this tone. Nicholas Refen mm-hmm. is a great guy for that. Now, like a lot of his TV series, people fucking hated. I loved them because if you surrender yourself to his tone and his vision, you then become in a trance that is that that series. So you've you're you're stuck in this in this world that he can then fuck with you in. Yeah. And and because they put you in a trance in a way, the scares that wouldn't necessarily be as scary in another film are triple scare, like are twice as scary because you're, you're now going, yeah, fuck like, Oh shit. Like this (laughs) breaks the rules of everything he just did. And it's hypnotic to the point where now you're in the world, you're fully immersed. So, so bottom line, have fucking patience, man. Like, yeah. g- go for this ride. Go for these things. Because most of the time, filmmakers know what they're doing. Most of the mm-hmm. time they do. Yeah. 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 I do wonder how some films get made. I started watching one the other day that I was just so disappointed about because I was like, the, the everything was just awful. But, and that's what I think about, like, when I compare it to, you know, you struggling to get, get something made for so long, I'm like, how there's good stuff out there. And then Dude. there's other stuff that's like made, like, you know, it's like microwave food and it just, you know, they just Dude. serve it to you on a platter and you're so upset. Dude, and nepotism and gatekeepers are a real thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's be real. About and it. that's not you. You're not the gatekeeper. right? No, that's why they're giving <laughs> me shit. And I laugh. I go, that's, you know, if only you knew. We can wrap this up in uh, a second. But since we were on the uh, topic of attention span, that's literally how my, my podcast became a thing. Because I noticed that I couldn't even watch a movie anymore, which I love. And 
you know, I'm just looking at my phone during a good movie and I'm like, I can only focus in a movie theater. Like, so I just need to find movies that, you know, look interesting, set my phone down, make that a, you know, like I will not touch it unless I'm taking notes. And, uh, then I just fell in love with the genre because I started looking at psychological thrillers and horror thrillers. And then I was like, you know what? I should just start talking about this because I'm feeling very passionate about these movies. There's something to be said about attention span. And, and just over the past week, having to answer all these messages with folks and having to go through thousands and thousands of, of uh, responses, um, at the end of the day, I, I would do this when I woke up and I would just, cons- I, I gave myself the whole week and I said, all right, I'll do this when I wake up and I'll go through and I answer as many people as I possibly can. Come 12 hours later, I'd be mentally and physically exhausted because of all of the dopamine, like just the hard rush of like getting reviews and getting responses and looking at it going, fuck, the numbers are amazing. And this consistently happened all week to the point I hit Saturday and I was exhausted and dead. I was just dead to the world. Um, And that's not because I was working harder. I was literally sitting on a couch and going through the phone and my hands were hurting because I was on the phone for so long. But that's it, dude. So mentally, I was just getting like overstimulated, overstimulated constantly. And a lot of folks don't want to talk about this because... How do you talk to someone that's addicted to cigarettes and you tell them that they have to stop smoking cigarettes, right? And if you drive down the street today, you go outside, drive down the street, look at how many people are on the street on their phones. I would guarantee you over 75% of the people just on the street standing and waiting for gas to pump into their car are on their phones consistently. Like this is a uh, an epidemic like cigarettes was. Yeah. And... Um, so it's always hard. I I try to talk to folks on the, on the podcast about this It's always hard to bring this up and remind them like this thing has been constructed to feed you with as much advertising, as much stuff and try to manipulate our emotions. This thing is more powerful than movies. This thing is more powerful than, than drugs to, to a certain extent because it's so accepted, widely accepted for children to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, and what happens is, as you get filtered through the algorithms, you get filtered one tone. So eventually it it may start wider, but then everything sort of comes down to this one tone that is affecting everybody. And, um, it's really hard to break those algorithms, whether you have your YouTube channel, whether you have something else that is consistently like, Hey, you like fucking cheeseburgers. Here's 500 different versions of a fucking cheeseburger get made. Next thing you know, you fall down in a cheeseburger hole and you're like, what the fuck have I done today? What have I learned? I've just looked at cheeseburgers all day. Same thing with cat videos and dog videos and all that kind of shit. And so what you're not getting is the actual perspective from other people. You're not hearing stories from other people. Uh, you generally, you're not, you may find something here and there, but most likely you're not. The thing that's great about movies is that because as a side effect of like all the resources that are needed, all the money that's needed, everything that's needed to make a film, uh, to a certain extent, a TV series, but more film in my mind, it has to be perfect. It has to be distilled. The process, the years that go into this person that's telling you the story, distilling it cramming every second, every shot with meaning, color contrast and camera angles and blocking and acting and everything means something. It's all a specific vision. You should feel lucky to have that. That is something that is new, that is blowing your mind open. And so if you understand that watching a movie is kind of like I'm not a religious person, but it's kind of like going to church to a certain extent where it's like, all right, it's time to watch a film. And most people are doing it at home now. So put your phone in the other room, shut it off, take some time before you start the movie because you're going to go through withdrawals on that phone. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, sort of sit there and go, all right, let's watch this and let yourself experience it. And the first few times you do it, you're going to be restless. And you're going to sit there and watch these movies and go, I'm feeling bored. And this isn't doing that. It's not because the movie's not good. It's because your brain is jacked up on fucking steroids where it's so used to getting this emotional response consistently. Let that dither out. Like, come down a bit. Go cold turkey. 
then start watching movies again. And when yeah. you start watching them again, your, the experiences will be so much better, so much greater, so much more fulfilling. And they don't take up as much of your life. You get an hour and a half, you got two hours. You're not sitting through something that's like 12 hours long. And each episode isn't really giving you anything new. And it's just teasing you to get to the next episode, to the next episode. What I like about films is that they're just perfectly put together moments. Um, that's regardless as to whether or not you like the film at the back end of it, you have to give them credit for, for spending all that time and energy to tell you one specific story through one specific voice. Yeah. Um, and that's like labor of love. That's like listening to an album. That's like any of that stuff. And it's refreshing and it's, it changes your life and you get out of the whole that is the fucking, you know, IV of fucking like, you know, Disney remakes or the, you know, what did you grow up loving? You love Transformers. There's fucking 12 series of Transformers <laughs> yeah. that. Here's a gorilla Transformer now. Yeah, dude. And you're just like, fuck, man, what, what am I getting out of this? And the stories seem boring because it's all the fucking same. So with that last question, because you're talking about how much time it goes into, um, you know, making a film. How long from writing the story to finishing the final edit did it take you to do 12KM? Well, I wrote the idea and stuff and I had the head injury. I came right out of the head injury and I went into raising money. We did a Kickstarter for it, which raised about, I'd say, maybe a third of what it was. Um, mm. Then uh, I'd say probably with the edit and everything, maybe a year. Maybe about a year. One year? Yeah, probably about a year. So that's between writing, filming, editing, all that? Yeah, probably about a year. Wow. Yeah. That was a lot quicker than I thought. Yeah, dude, it's a short, but still. I was just thinking because it's been six years since it's come out, I was kind of imagining that it was more of like a, I don't know, like a two or three year process of like developing it and whatnot. But no, that's, that's really cool that you could make it happen that quick and that if, if you have the idea, you can take actionable steps to get it done, like within the year, yeah. you know, at least with a short. Dude, I just, um, before all this happened, I just shot a new short two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So we just shot for two overnights. So we did two overnights for it. It's going to be a shorter piece. It'll probably be like five minutes max. Um, but we just shot a short that I'm supposed to be doing both production on, but I've been dealing with all this. Um, yeah. that one I, I hope to have done, um, by January. So nice. Yeah. 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 You could totally get stuff done quicker if you want. I mean, 12 cam was just all, it was a lot like this. I had to go meet with the scientists and go shoot all of the practical effects through uh, microscopes. I had to go through a whole long casting session with, with Russian actors in New York and, Mm -hmm. it was it was a lot involved with that one when you when yeah you have to make sure that your script is translated properly in russian <laughs> and not like, do you have to like get that double verified or triple verified <laughs> yeah i had two translators on set i had a translator there to tell me what the actors were saying and i had another translator to tell me if that translator was lying about it <laughs> and then um yeah, the, if, if you guys, once you get to know me, you understand that I'm pretty sarcastic and I, you know, oftentimes very cynical. Uh, sarcasm does not translate to Russian at all. <laughs> so like translating a script uh, that was full of sarcasm to Russian actors, especially like um, Ernst, who plays the professor. He's amazing. Uh, he just passed away recently. Um, oh, no. But he was such a wonderful actor. He was like the Al Pacino of Russian stage actors and. Uh, him and I bumped up against each other quite often where he was just like, Russians don't say this. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, but an American kid wrote this. So, you know, um, <laughs> you gotta say it. <laughs> yeah. So how do we, make, how do we come where somewhere in between here? You know? Yeah. Well, that's cool. Uh, well, so before we go, um, you want to plug in love with the process again? Is that the, do you have a social media just for that? And yeah. So, I, my podcast is called In Love With The Process. Um, you can search for In Love With The Process in my name, just Mike Petchy. You'll find it on Spotify. You'll find it on Apple Podcasts. Or you can just go to inlovewiththeprocess.com. If you go to inlovewiththeprocess.com, 
I've curated all my episodes because I think we're at like 223 or something. I've curated all the episodes based upon subject material. So if you want to just listen to the director episodes, if you just want to listen to the horror director episodes, I have chefs on the show. I have musicians on the show. Um, it's a fun podcast. I think you guys will like it. And if you want to see uh, the movie, and this is how I'll plug it. If you want to see the movie, go to inlovewiththeprocess.com and listen to episode 222. 222 in that episode, you'll have to sit through the episode. Don't be lazy. Um, but in that episode, I give out a password. And on the homepage of inlovewiththeprocess.com, you can enter the password to see the movie. All right. So those of you who want to do that can do that there. For you, would you rather a hat or a shirt? Because I'm going to send you some. Oh. Send for me, Psycho Cinematic. Send me, uh, send me a shirt. I think a shirt right, would be cool. cool That's uh, this shirt. And I haven't shown the audience it either. One second. Let me turn around. Yeah. You just, just remind me. We're getting our 12KM shirts done. I'll send you a shirt. Yeah, that's cool. I'll wear that. I'll wear the shit out of that. Yeah, I'll send you a 12KM shirt. We just got the shirts made for fans. Nice. Yeah, the, the design is sick. Yeah, well, that was done by my buddy Orlando Baez. He did that years ago for us. Um, that skull design, which plays on what happens in the movie, but also plays on my head injury, which is fun. Mm -hmm. uh, Super cool. And then um, also, if you buy a t-shirt from us, you get a link. So that's also nice. another thing. So you can do Heck all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, all the all the links will be down in the description of this video, and I'm sure likewise on your podcast as well. Yeah, man. In general, I just I gotta say, dude, thanks for posting about it. Thanks for asking to watch the movie. Yeah, um, absolutely. If this is not a a great fan experience, I don't know what is. The fact that you did yeah. a post and you have over three million fucking clicks of views on it, it's insane. Um, it's wild. And when I when when I ended the video with uh, genius or pretentious, I was like, oh fuck, he, he's gonna hate me after this. <laughs> no, well, <laughs> it's I, like I don't even know him, but I'm making an enemy. Here we go, <laughs> dude. I laughed. I when I read that, I went That's genius. That's genius because <laughs> that will drive traffic. Um, yeah. And before that, dude, because I hadn't seen this right away, I just saw your your review on 12 Cam, and I thought your review was phenomenal. So thank you. Um, that in itself, if you guys haven't seen it, you should probably go do it. And I'll make sure to put links under this episode, but if you've seen 12 cam and you want to get into some deeper thoughts and theories on it, uh, Vic's, uh, review for it is really good. Yeah. And I've got like 20 something other episodes out right now for the psychological thriller and the horror thriller lovers out there. Those are the only movies I'm covering on that podcast just cause I find the most sustenance in them. Um, but yeah, so if you guys like that, check that out. Uh, you probably should, because there's most likely a reason why your post, not just because of the, the thing, but the way you speak on camera, the way you put your shit together, there's a reason why it got, you know, fucking 3 million. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's, that's dope. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. And then the last thing that, that call to action, uh, hit up Guillermo del Toro. Yes. <laughs> Watch me get some shit. Hit him up. Yes, let's do it. Let me start another fucking shit cycle here. Yeah, go hit him up. Tell him that uh, you want him to see 12KM. Ask him why he hasn't seen 12KM yet. And honestly say, you know, this should be a Cabinet of Curiosities episode. I would do that. Call to action. That would be dope. Go do it. I think he's on, I think he's on Twitter. I know he's got an Instagram page, but I don't think he's on that. So I think the one that he responds to the most is probably on Twitter. So I'll save you guys the energy. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, thanks again for doing this. And thank you everyone for listening if you've made it this far. And uh, yeah, check out the links down below. All right. Thanks, buddy. All right. Thank you.